in the winter time. And if I could just pick up a little bit on the demeanor of Paul, I, I kind of get the feeling that he sounds like somebody who needs a vacation. <laughs> Amen. Doesn't that sound like, well, he, he, he's a little weary. He, uh, he needs, in my mind, he needs uh, a vacation. And, and he's hoping to, to make it pretty soon. But, but then when we look at uh, and notice verse 9, it, verse 9 says, But I will stay on at Ephesus until Pentecost because a great door of effective work has opened up to me, and there are many who oppose me. Uh, Paul didn't know it when he wrote these words, but but God opened was opening up a door for him in Ephesus, and Paul ends up, however, staying three years, more than twice as long as he ever stayed in any place on his journey. And from what I read and from what we could read, God not only used Paul to start a, a great church in Ephesus, but, but while he was there, many more churches were started in the towns and in the cities around Ephesus. And this became a center from which the gospel flowed throughout all the provinces surrounding them. And now the point that I really want to make is this. When, when Paul saw that a great door was opening for him, he saw three things. And that's what I want to talk about tonight, the mission of three things. He saw that it was a door of opportunity. He saw that it was a door of obligation. And he also saw it was a door of opposition. And a door, a door of, of opportunity. Ephesus was not exactly a place where most Christians would have wanted to settle. Oh, it was a big city. It, one of the major cities in the eastern Mediterranean uh, area. It was a, a financial and a commercial center. It was the Beverly Hills. It was the Brentwood. It was a very rich city. And it boasted of one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. The temple of Diana was there with all of its gross immorality and, and legalized prostitution. In fact, that was a part of the worship of the goddess Diana. It was a city where people were superstitious. It was a city where they believed in magic and they were constantly looking for soothsayers and fortune tellers to guide their lives. And it was not a place where Christians would normally want to live. But when Paul looked at Ephesus, he saw the hundreds of thousands of people going about their daily activities. And, and, and he said, there is an open door here. And I think I will stay a little while longer. He saw the opportunity that was there. Someone has said that the difference between a pessimist and an optimist is that a pessimist sees a problem in every opportunity. Amen. But an optimist sees an opportunity in every problem. And Paul saw the opportunities and there were so many people who needed to hear about Jesus. And Paul was determined to share the gospel with them. 
in the United States Center of World Missions back reported that in uh, A.D. 33 and on, uh, when the church was just getting started, they said that there were about 200 million people in the world and, and, and roughly only about 5,000 Christians. And that's a ratio of 40,000 to one. But by the year 1900, there was a billion people in the world. And it said that there were 10 million who believed in Jesus. That's a ratio of 100 to 1. Today, there are from 5 to 7 to 9 billion people in our world. And somebody said that only 500 million are really following closely Christianity. Not counting the 1.2 billion who are nominal Christians. I'm going to tell you what that means a little bit later on. And so, and people, my brothers and sisters, that's a ratio of 10 to 1. Now, what does that tell us? First of all, it tells us that the gospel of Christ is having an ever-increasing impact, impact on the non-Christian world. It also tells us that there are more people getting a little bit more serious about their faith. And all we have to do, all we have to do is win 10 people apiece. And the world would have been won to Jesus. All we have to do, and, and, and all we have to do, all you, I'm sorry, all you have to do is to win 10 people in your lifetime. That's all you got to do. Is to win 10 people. And, and, and the world will know more about Christ than ever before. And, and so Paul was, Paul was a master, a master missionary. He said, I've become all things to all people. You know what that meant? He said, if you need a preacher, I'll be a preacher. He said, if you need a teacher, I'll be a teacher. He said, if you need a tent maker, I'll make tents with you. I will become all things as some of you might come to know Jesus Christ. And we must also recognize that there's more than one way to get the job done. In the 13th chapter of the book of Acts, the church in Antioch did very much like we are doing this day. They sent Paul and Barnabas and sent them out to preach the gospel. They prayed for them, and, and they supported them. But remember also back in the 8th chapter of the book of Acts, that persecution fell upon the church in Jerusalem. And many Christians had to run from Jerusalem in order to escape this terrible persecution. In essence, we would think that is the most horrible thing in the world. That all of a sudden we have all of these Christians worshiping in Jerusalem. And all of these people came and wanted to kill them and want to beat them up. And, and they had to run. They had to run for their lives. In essence, in essence, they had to leave the city and go wherever they were to be saved. And to be saved. But there's something interesting about what happened in Jerusalem. Something really uh, uh, phenomenal took place. And, and when I first read this, when I first studied this, I was thinking how awful it is for somebody to come in and, and, and start trying to uh, uh, beat up Christians and, and threaten them with their very lives, and they have to get out of town. And that's what happened in Jerusalem. But look at verse 4. Verse 4 tells us those who had been scattered, they preached the word wherever they went. And so God had a way of spreading his gospel. He allowed some persecution to come up on that church. And that church then uh, had to split all over the place. 
And I believe, and I may be wrong, but I believe that they have started to get complacent. They have become comfortable in that situation, and they started to surround themselves and say, let's just worship and go home. That reminds me of, that reminds me of some people who are just as comfortable as they can come into the little small church house and get to worship on and go home. Don't be surprised if some pestilence might show up. I, I, I'm getting ahead of myself because uh, at the third part of this, there was an opposition. Uh, today, uh, people have been moved from one place in this world to another. And they're doing it in record numbers. Executives and businessmen and uh, experts and teachers are, are going to places like Japan, they're going to places like Mexico, they're going to places like Africa, and, and people from all over the world are coming to our cities as well. And God can use this scattering to give us opportunities to share the gospel with the world. And I hope that I can impress on your mind that you're going to have to stop being so comfortable with where we are and get out of here and go tell the world that Jesus still lives. Uh, after the borders of the Iron Curtain was open, all of a sudden Bibles were being sent to these countries. And I don't know about you, but we're spoiled. I don't know what you think, but we're spoiled. And let me tell you how. You know, you're not spoiled unless there's some way to uh, compare what you do with what somebody else does. And so among ourselves, we don't think we're spoiled. But if we lost our jobs and could live on, on a dollar and a dollar fifty a day, then all of a sudden we'd commit suicide. And, and let me tell you, let me tell you, at, at the end of the service, uh, Brother Webb and others are going to come around and pick up Bibles. And they're going to put your lost Drop Bible in that place over there. And you're going to come back next week. Why? And who took my Bible? Do you realize, do you realize that in Ethiopia alone, that, that, that it, is, it, is, it is a Rolls Royce idea to have a Bible? That if you, if you were to ask many of the people in the country, what is it that you want the most in the church? You would think that they would want uh, some money to, to, uh, to buy food. You would think that they would want some money to build a better house that is not made of mud and grass roof. But if you really ask those Christians, what is it that you would like to have the most? You know what they would tell you? I want a Bible. Those are the things that we take for granted. Those are the things that, oh, I got one around here somewhere. But to have a Bible for someone who lives in Africa, who had never had an opportunity to read, something is going to be, uh, some debt is going to be paid by somebody because we're not spreading the gospel. And there are so many different ways in which it could be done. And so today... Doors are open all over the world. And I think God is getting ready for a great surge before he comes again. And never before, as never before, we have wonderful opportunities to go through doors and preach the gospel to people who have never been free to hear it before. And then, and then, and then Paul, said, uh, Paul said, I have a door of obligation. The first point was he had a door of opportunity. And now he has a door of obligation. He, he saw a door. He said, the door is open to me. He didn't say it was open to Timothy. He didn't say it was open to Barnabas or somebody else. He said the door was open to him. And he felt a personal obligation to stay in Ephesus to preach the word of God to them. Personal. We must each realize that I can't go to work for you. 
I, I can't do your work. And some of you who think you can, can't do my work for me. We have a personal obligation to share the gospel wherever we are. And as we see uh, new homes being built in our neighborhoods, it's an opportunity to reach out. God is opening doors, but it's become my obligation. It has come, become your obligation to walk through the door. And I was reading this story about a girl named Amy. Not Amy. Not our Amy, but a, another Amy. And she was talking about having a dream. And she was dreaming that she was in her jungle sitting beside a campfire one night. And in her dream, she was watching the flames of the fire soar into the sky. And she was said that she could see a grassy place, a clearing in the jungle. And he said she saw many people walking across it toward a terrible cliff, about hundreds of feet in the air, a cliff. She said in her dream she saw a mother with a little girl clinging to her skirt as she was walking toward the cliff and nobody said anything to her. You're walking toward the cliff. Nobody said anything. And she fell over the cliff. And Amy could hear her scream as she fell to her death. And then she said uh, she saw a little boy walking toward walking toward the cliff. And she said this little boy was blind even as the mother and the little girl prior had been blind. And he was walking toward his death. And as he was walking toward his death, Amy thought, why doesn't somebody say something? Why does somebody say something to him and to them. And the little boy fell over the cliff. And on his way down, he grabbed a little branch uh, 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 that had grown out of the cliff. And hanging on the, hanging on the, uh, onto the little branch, he was screaming for help. Somebody help me. Why doesn't somebody help me? And finally, the branch fell, broke, and he fell to his death. And she said in her dream, there were thousands of others, all of them blind. And she said all of them were heading toward the cliff. And then Amy said in her dream, she said, I cried. I cried from the depths of my soul. Why doesn't someone tell them about the cliff? Why don't someone warn them that there's danger ahead? And then she said, I heard the voice of God saying, whom shall I send? And she said, I'll go. I'll go. All right, said the Lord, then you are my messenger. There's no doubt that you've seen a lot of people who are blind walking into a, off a cliff of sin. And you're watching them. Wondering why don't somebody tell them? So many blind people, blind to salvation. And we watch them fall off a cliff because we say, let them go. You see, that's a picture of our world. There's a cliff. And people are walking blindly toward it. Does anybody care? Will anybody stand with Isaiah and say, here, my Lord, send me? I know that most of us don't really get how tired, it, how tired it is to fly from here to Africa. How tired it is. But, but when the mission and when the statement comes, who shall I send? You don't think about the 18 hours on the airplane. You think about there's some soul that's headed, that's blind, that's heading to a cliff and going to fall off. And God said, I'm the one. That you are the one that's got to go and stop them. Right. And then I'm going to close with this. There's the door of opposition that Paul said. 
he saw a door of opposition. He said, there are many. I'm going to stay here. There are many who oppose me. It, it's, it's true. There, there, are always, there will always be those who oppose the advancement of the gospel. In Ephesus, here's the reason. In Ephesus, there was Demetrius who made silver idols and sold them for profit. And when the gospel was proclaimed and people became Christians, they stopped worshiping idols. And Demetrius went out of business. He got mad. You took away my livelihood. You took away my money. And so he went after Paul. And he started persecuting him. He became an opponent of the gospel. Perhaps the worst opponents to the advancement of the gospel are not its enemies. It's not really the enemies. They are the people who sit in the pews who are nominal Christians. Now you get it. Uh, I did my duty. I dropped my dollar in the, in the, in the collection. But I took my communion. Nominal Christians. We hear, they hear the message. They see the blind people walking toward the, 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 uh, uh, the cliff, but they go home unmoved and don't care. And they are among the worst opponents. Many years ago, there was a dictator of Romania named Nicolae Ceausescu. Anybody ever heard of him? He was a cruel dictator. He was executed by revolutionaries, and you probably saw his bullet-written body on the newscast, and those revolutionary forces emptied their rifles of ammunition as they shot him again and again and again. And those who knew the situation in Romania said that it was probably a mercy killing. For if he had been captured by the people in the street, it, they would have torn him apart, tissue by tissue, because they hated him so much. And he and his wife, and held the people in contempt for years. And, and Romania was a fertile country. And they raised good crops. But he sold the crops to Russia and put the money in his pocket and built himself palaces all over the place. And his people were starving. And his wife said that if you give those worms food, they'll just ask for more. And finally, the people had enough. They rebelled, and they took him and his wife prisoner. They executed both of them, and the news media showed us pictures of his body. But you don't know what happened after that. There was something interesting that happened. There was a preacher who climbed up on the balcony in the square where many of the communist leaders had stood before preaching there is no God. And this preacher began to speak. And he, he, he was underground. He was, he, his underground name was Brother Paul. And he of the other preachers uh, uh, who were supported by churches in the United States. He stood on that balcony and he looked down. Y'all didn't know this part. He looked down at the thousands of people who were gathered there. And he began shouting at the top of his voice. And he said, our God is alive, our God is alive. And the people started shouting back at, in unison, our God is alive, our God is alive. For the first time in decades, the people of Romania were free to proclaim their Christianity in the streets of the city. Let me get a little personal. Same thing happened in, 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 in Africa, in Ethiopia, when they had the communist government ruling. And Romo and the others were in this house worshiping. They had put shutters on the doors. And then all of a sudden, the police came and kicked it in. And weren't thinking that they were in a revolutionary state. Had to prove that they were just preaching the gospel. Listen, how many of us would run if the police kicked the door in? And so I'm going to arrest you because you are anti-government. We are free. And because of that freedom, the devil is taking advantage. And the devil has said, don't go preach in Africa. You just go next door. 
Don't go around the corner. Don't go around the corner. Don't go on the other side of the world. Let me tell you, everybody in this country has access to a Bible. And, and it can be given free. Seven dollars will send a Bible to Africa where hundreds of people will read from the same Bible. Our mission is that we need to deal with the opposition that exists right in the church for preaching the gospel of Christ. And the greatest opposition is not overt. It is complacency. It is that, okay, I did mine. I got mine. And I've, I've worshipped today. Your mission is to preach the gospel and take advantage of every opportunity. And, and, and Paul was tired. Do you realize that I drove hour and a half, hour and a half, came in with a terrible headache. And I knew that I couldn't make it here, so I went home and, and, and couldn't find the aspirin. And so I found the ones that Mary hid. And, and I took those, and I said, well, I'm just going to go down to the building, and then we're going to sit there and let, let the pain go away because of the pill that I took. Some of us need to take a pill to get us going so that the gospel of Christ can be preached. That's your mission. That is your obligation. This is your opportunity. And if you can't go, then you can send somebody. Because I know a lot of people who want to go, who want to go, and who want to go and cannot go. Maybe a Bible. Somebody here. Y'all are quiet tonight. I like that. Because I haven't seen anybody drop their head yet. Somebody here tonight who need to get themselves right with the Lord. And I mean right with the Lord. You may not hear this sermon ever again. You might not even hear another sermon. So in this message, in this message, here's what you really need to hear. That Jesus Christ is alive. Resurrected from the dead. Back in heaven. Sent the Holy Spirit. Left us his church, his body. We are members of that church. And if you're not a member, he says, here's the way you become one. He said, hear the gospel, and that's all about Jesus. Believe that he is the son of God. Repent of your sins. Confess him. And then be baptized in water for the remission of your sins. That's what you do. And, 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 and it's what's so interesting, and what's so interesting, and I hate to say this, and it's really an indictment of us as Americans. We spend more of your, your contribution money building a beautiful, clean, warm baptistry. Because when we were in Africa, we had to go to the river. And I remember the last time uh, near Hosanna, uh, we had to dig out the... Uh, the river, and it still wasn't deep enough. So what we did is laid uh, the person down in the muddy water with his head above the water, and then said we baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, then put his head under the water. Because the rest of the body was already there. We're spoiled. So what you do, if you haven't been baptized for the remission of your sins. To be added to the church by the Lord. You ought to do that right now. You ought to come to him before it's too late. And, and, and those who have been playing. Those who are nominal Christians. It's time to become real. And to make a life change. Come to him right now. While we stand together. While we sing this song of invitation. The opportunity is yours. Walk while we got the chance. eyes against the come light. To him right now. Poor sinner, hide not your heart, be saved, oh, tonight, oh, why not tonight, oh, why not tonight, will thou be saved, then why not tonight 
Tomorrow's sun may never rise To bless thy long deluded sight This is the time of then be wise Be safe, oh, tonight Oh, why not tonight? Oh, why Please be seated. May God bless you. May God bless you. Will thou be saved?